I just want to welcome you all, uh, all the participants to this uh, webinar that has been uh, put together by the University Department of Laboratory Diagnostic and Investigative Sciences, Cape Peninsula University of Technology Department of Biomedical Sciences, Stellenbosch University Division of Chemical Pathology, and the University of Pretoria Department of Chemical Pathology, working in collaboration with the African Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, and Empower uh, School of Health. And uh, this is uh, part of the effort of this consortium to strengthen health care uh, in terms of laboratory uh, uh, work in the in the healthcare in the in the African region, and we anticipate what we are doing will allow us to give or to upskill our colleagues in the lab as we continue in this endeavor of uh, laboratory work. And this uh, webinar is part of our effort on the Medical Laboratory Professional Week, which was uh, on last week. There were lots of events and we thought, we saw it fit that this event will push it forward to this week to allow other events to go on. And uh, allow me to just uh, open in a word of prayer. Dear God, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to speak to, sci to scientists, to lab, lab professionals in the African region and beyond as we seek to improve laboratory work. We pray that this workshop, we may be able to inspire and aff affect in a positive way the work of the laboratory professionals. I thank you and we also think of our colleague Prof. Omuse who couldn't join us today because of the emergency. We pray that all may go well. We thank you and we commit everything into your hands. Amen. Our uh, first uh, part will be an introduction that will be done by Prof. Rajiv Erasmus, the president of the African Federation of Clinical Chemistry, uh, and, and he also says that the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry Task Force on COVID-19, the public relations, point of care testing, and the Committee for Biomarkers for Diabetes. Prof. Erasmus also co-founded the College of Pathologists of East, and, East Central and Southern Africa in 2010 and is its current vice president. And uh, Prof. Erasmus is also my, my mentor and has been instrumental in all the work towards this workshop. So I will allow him to make the introductions. Um, good morning, uh, fellow colleagues and participants. Um, I think uh, I just want to thank Ian for that uh, lovely introduction. Some of you know me um, through our interaction on the African continent. But indeed, um, I just want to say a few words on behalf of the Africa Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Lab Medicine. As you all know, uh, we are a sub-federation of the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Lab Medicine. And uh, we have roughly about 10 member countries that belong to this uh, federation. And one of our aims is to promote education and training and capacity building throughout the continent of Africa so that um, we can improve the quality of lab testing in Africa in particular. As you know, we are going through the COVID pandemic and uh, lab professionals have indeed played a key role in contributing to the management and diagnosis of this, uh, of this uh, uh, sad condition. I just also want to thank Ian for the, for the prayers that he, he, he put out this morning. 
But in particular, we want to pray for India. Um, so, uh, Sonia is in India. And uh, as you know, uh, this morning, nearly 400,000 new cases uh, have been diagnosed in, in India. And it has been the biggest number in the world so far with uh, several thousand deaths. So our prayers are also with our colleagues in India. Um, I just heard this morning that one of our colleagues from the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry, Dr. Seema Bhargava, her father died yesterday from COVID and her mother is also down with COVID. So many of our colleagues uh, in the lab profession are down with COVID and they are fighting this battle um, uh, against COVID in, in India. So our prayers are also with them. Um, and I just want to also thank the speakers for uh, taking part in this meeting. Uh, I'm sure Ian will introduce uh, our first speaker, but I just want to say a few words on our second speaker because I also know him personally, and that's Prof Pillay from the University of Pretoria. He's also the uh, one thing that uh, Ian did not mention was that he's also the president of the South African Association of Clinical Biochemistry. So apart from serving on the board uh, on, on, the, on the CPD committee of the IFCC, he's also the president as well as the head of Department of Chemical Pathology at uh, University of Pretoria. So uh, over to Ian and welcome to all the participants who have joined us across Africa. Um, I just want to also remind ourselves that um, uh, we are celebrating the Lab Professionals Week, which uh, started on the 18th and finished on the 24th. And the Africa Federation of Clinical Chemistry has been celebrating this week by giving a number of we webinars in collaboration with our colleagues at the University of Zimbabwe, uh, Stellenbosch, Pretoria, and Cape Peninsula University of Technology. So thank you so much once again, and we hope that you guys are going to benefit from this series of webinars that the Federation has planned. Over to you, uh, Ian. All right, thank you very much, Pro, and uh, 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 thank you also for not noting the challenges that we have in India and all over the world due to COVID. And we continue to think of them and uh, commit them. And uh, our, uh, I just want to urge us all as we participate in this uh, webinar that we can put our questions uh, on the chat box and we'll be able to respond to them during the, the time of, of the round table discussion. And uh, uh, also to note one of our speaker, Prof. Geoffrey Omuse could not be with us uh, because uh, 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 he has had a medical emergency. His wife is in labor at the moment, but all will go according to, to plan, we we'll just miss his talk only. Our first speaker is Professor Arthur Mandisoza. He is an Associate Professor of Hematology and Blood Transfusion Science in the Medical Laboratory Sciences Unit in the Department of Laboratory Diagnostic and Investigative Sciences at the University of Zimbabwe. He is also a hematology consultant for the UZ UCSF research project since 2011. Uh, over to you, Prof. Mandisoza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for taking time to attend this uh, presentation. I think uh, I'm going to be uh, excited to know um, talking to the experts. It's not a new subject but uh, it's a matter of trying to consolidate the importance of uh, good laboratory practice. Well, my topic is uh, accreditation in laboratory medicine. 
This is a fairly common uh, topic, but the question is, are we practicing the, 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 the accreditation requirements? Okay. Right. I'm going to concentrate my discussion on the listed uh, topics. Uh, uh, just bear with me. Again, I'm saying we are all familiar with the, the subject. So there are people out there who know better than me. So but this is a point of full interest because we need to make sure that we maintain our good laboratory practices. So I'm going to go through that list of topics from So, accreditation is essentially has been necessitated by global competitions for global for good products. We want good products. If we want good products, we need to compete to produce those good products. What is it? It is a procedure by which an authoritative body gives formal recognition that an organization or a person is competent to carry out certain tasks. That's the, the definition. Its scope can be highly specific depending on our business. So accreditation allows assessment of people, the, their skills and the knowledge using recognized recognize the assessors. These are specialists who assess um, right. So we are saying they evaluate or it evaluates the supporting management systems for specific activities. It may involve practical tests where it is appropriate. Accreditation is carried out by nationally or internationally recognized bodies. So these are the guys who inspect and determine whether we are doing the right thing. It is the surest way of penetrating global market, with, uh, which, which I've indicated earlier on that if we wanted to sell our products, they have to be good. We can only make sure that they are good by participating in accreditation uh, processes. So accreditation is based on meeting requirements for certain ISO standards. What are ISO standards? The ISO stands for International Organization for Standardization. And we usually add IEC, which is, stands for International Electrotechnical Commission. These are the standard bodies whose function is to implement um, activities that pertain to accreditation. National bodies participate in the development of these standards through technical committees. So the technical te committees should consist of people who are highly specialized in these tasks. For recognition of their products and services, clients are expected to meet specific ISO IC, IEC requirements. So the specific ISO IEC guides are those listed there. And we are essentially interested in the first three there, uh, ISO 151-89, which 
specifies the requirements for assessment of medical laboratories. I think in our case, we should be very familiar with that ISO standard and practice it. ISO 1, ISO IEC 17025. This is a general um, standard which stipulates requirements for testing and calibrating laboratories, but it covers almost everything. If I remember well, and the blood transfusion is assessed on the basis of that ISO. Then we have got ISO IEC 15190. This has been often ignored essentially, but as medical laboratory scientists, we need to be very familiar for this because it protects against safety hazards in the laboratory. Given the past experiences, we have almost had three, uh, two people who died in the laboratory because of exposure to hazards. So we need to be familiar with that ISO as well. Then the other three ISOs, the one that is specific for, for proficiency testing, where we check in. how we do our test. The ISO 117 of 25, um, that one, as I said earlier on, is the major standard for quality management systems, and it can affect our, uh, our operations as well. So compliance with its requirements means the organization operates quality systems. So we need to make sure that we are familiar with that one. The ISO specifies the general requirements for competencies to carry out uh, tests or calibration. So overall, that's an important ISO. It can also look at the management aspect. What is it that the management should know? So how is the organization of the, the, the institution? What are the quality systems in place? How do we control our documents? Review of requests, tender, and contracts. These are stated in this ISO. Uh, Subcontracting of tests or calibrations, if that happens, how should they be done? Purchasing services, Purchasing services and supplies, how should it be done? And also the general services to the client. How do we handle complaints? These are in that uh, major uh, ISO. So again, control of non-conformities, conformity testing, how do we control? What does the management does? Okay. What does it do to control these uh, non-conformities? Corrective action that is taken if there is something that is missing in a medical laboratory setting. How do we prevent those problems? Okay. Internal audit. How do we take care of uh, our internal affairs, the way we do business? How do we handle that? That's management responsibility. Technical requirements, again, what is it? These are many factors that determine the correctness and the reliability of laboratory tests and the calibration. Okay, these are listed as personnel. How is the personnel well trained, accommodation, and the environmental conditions? Here we can have a laboratory, this is, which is situated 
in um, an area where it is not supposed to be, how do you handle those things? If we are accredited, these problems can be avoided. Testing and calibration methods and the methods of validation, what type of equipment are we using in the lab in order to get reliable results? All these are technical requirements that are stated in the ISO 17025. How do we measure traceability? If we have a problem, how do we measure? How do we trace that problem so that it can be avoided? How do we store our samples, especially our um, um, human samples? Okay. How do we actually do the testing uh, techniques? All these must be stated or are usually requirements that are stated in that ISO. We also assure quality of test and calibration by using that standard. Then we look at our critical ISO standard, which is 15189. We have documents that have been prepared and uh, pertaining to 151.89. This is the ISO of interest for medical laboratories because it states requirements for the way we should do business if we are to be recognized as a very, or if we are to be recognized as a, a, a reliable uh, institution. We have a version that was published in the country by the Standard Association of Zimbabwe. This is in pertaining to the, the, the Zimbabwe. And this was developed in partnership with 12 organizations that participate in medical laboratory testing. So I think it's quite a solid document, that one. The standard 151 is intended specifically for clinical laboratories, as I have mentioned above, and in vitro diagnostic testing systems. And it monitors disciplines such as those that are listed, blood transfusion, uh, clinical chemistry, hematology, hemostasis, histology, immunology, microbiology, and the genetics. So just to mention a few. I saw 151.89. Essentially, we are saying, in addition to the above standard, medical laboratories must develop a wider scope for other ISOs. We need to know other ISO, ISOs for quality and the competence relevant to our practice. Okay. Staff must be familiar with the terms and the definitions used in accreditation processes. Laboratory administrators must be knowledgeable about management requirements such as their organization, the quality systems in place, uh, document control, contract review. I think this is a, a just a, a, a vision of what I've said above. Right. ISO 151 was developed by a technical committee, ISO TC 212 in 2000 and, uh, and uh, three. Uh, after noticing quite a, a number of uh, uh, accidents that were happening in the medical laboratory. So this was developed. And so we are saying medical laboratories which deal with biological agents and the human symbols uh, are the ones that should do. Um, be familiar with this um, ISO because it's uh, 
is uh, intended for our safety. The standard is specifically designed for safety requirement in the medical laboratory. I want to just emphasize. So in addition to the 150, 189, we need to be familiar with the 150, 190 as well. Although ISO 151 is not part of the requirements for accreditation currently, I think safety concerns may force institutions and the governments to consider it as an accreditation requirement. That is important. Are we implementing the accreditation um, processes? I think it's a difficult because we don't have, and in case of Zimbabwe, we don't have a national accreditation body. So we depend mostly on the uh, SANAS, which has kindly helped us in uh, processing accreditation issues. So if we really wanted to take this accreditation seriously, we might need to have that established in our country. The increase in private medical laboratories and cases of fraudulent results, especially pertaining to HIV, where people are given false, false uh, uh, COVID, uh, this is not HIV, COVID-19 certificates, it's a serious offense. And if labos, laboratories are accredited, maybe we can avoid some of these uh, problems. So far, I think we, can, we need to give credit to the South African National Accredit, Accreditation System, which has been responsible for uh, implementation of accreditation processes in the region. They have done so much work for us in the region. So uh, they still can play a major role for us. It has also been involved in the training of laboratory systems and the technical assessors for the region. So we need their service in order to ex expand our services in relationship to accreditation. So in conclusion, I'll say accreditation allows for product reliability and the global market competitiveness. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity to discuss the issue of accreditation with the forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Van Soda, for such an enlightening uh, uh, discussion on accreditation. It is very essential for accreditation and uh, la laboratories in Africa need to work towards this. And there have been many pro program, several programs which have been in place to strengthen the labs in, uh, towards accreditation. And we hope the efforts of these programs will result in the accreditation of laboratories, ensuring good quality uh, practice in the lab as we have the standards and the way of doing things being reliably audited by an external reviewer. Our next uh, uh, speaker would be Prof. Tai Pile, the head of the Department of Chemical Pathology and uh, Pathology at the University of Pretoria. He is also the president of the South, South African Association for Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine, and he chairs the Communication and Public Division uh, of the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Pathology. He is going to share on the why, how, and when of risk management for the clinical laboratory. Over to you, Prof. Pile.
good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you to, uh, for this invitation uh, to speak at this meeting. I'm just going to start my, um, my slide share now. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, let's go into discussion. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is try to give you, normally this um, talk would run over several hours, but I'm going to try and, uh, and, and, and uh, um, summarize it in, in, this, in this time slot, but uh, maybe now where we have uh, uh, some extra time, uh, we can, um, uh, I can take it a little bit slower. So, so I said we're going to talk about the the how, uh, why, and when. I think maybe the when we can probably uh, dispense with uh, immediately because the when is actually all the time, uh, and and the, and the why and the how is probably the more important aspect of that. The why you could probably uh, as from the previous speaker. Uh, the accreditation aspect. Uh, uh, so for accreditation, you need a quality management plan. And in that management plan, I will see, as we will see, you need to have a, um, a risk management strategy. And we'll see why that's important. So if we look at, okay, so, uh, no, I didn't want... okay, here we go, yeah. So we'll talk about potential risks, first of all, how to do a risk assessment, uh, risk register, uh, doing a risk mitigation plan. And then I will briefly mention this important document, the EP23A, which provides guidelines uh, for risk management. So we said, why should the clinical laboratory bother about risk? So you'll see it's important for, the, for any quality management plan. Um, how should the lab, lab manage risk? Uh, we will we'll, we'll cover that. And we've already covered the aspect of, of when this should be done. So risk is, is a very simple concept to understand. It's basically the chance of suffering or encountering harm or loss. That's according to the Webster's Dictionary. And it can be estimated through the combination of a probability of uh, a harm occurring and the amount, the impact of that harm or the impact of, of the hazard. So you have to consider two things, the chances of when it's going to occur and how bad it's going to be. So if you take an example, if uh, in in the, the Southern African region that we live in, um, we can um, basically, we don't have, for example, uh, earthquakes. So the chance of an earthquake, probability of an earthquake is very low. So we don't, it's, it's uh, but uh, if it did happen, it would be quite severe. But actually, if you combine the two, we don't really have to plan too much. You know, we don't have to do much planning to build around earthquakes as say in other countries. In in the context of the, of the clinical laboratory, so what does it mean for a clinical uh, medical laboratory? It's the potential. So the, the, end, the end user of the, uh, of the laboratory is firstly the patient, and then there's also the staff. So the potential for uh, error that can occur that could either harm the patient or the staff. And so that's where the, the, the real consideration of risk comes in. So uh, Labor Although laboratories were started much later than other industries in, in, in doing uh, risk management, it has been around um, in healthcare, certainly in clinical healthcare since the 70s, patient safety programs, and then medical laboratories started to engage with us uh, maybe around 2003. Uh, airlines, of course, have been doing it for many, many years. Uh, because that was very integral to the to the way airlines operate. Um, so whilst uh, it became a formal process, 
uh, we, we probably were doing it unconsciously every day and, and we certainly do it in our lives every day without even thinking. We do risk management every day without even thinking about it. So the number of, of definitions we can look at, uh, a risk analysis from the ISO uh, 151, uh, it's a systematic use of available information to identify hazards. And this uh, that uses information from a number of different sources. Um, the risk assessment is the overall process uh, comprising a risk analysis and a risk evaluation. And the risk evaluation is the process of comparing the estimated risk against given risk criteria. And that's defined in ISO 14971. So you heard about ISO in the, in the previous talk. And one of the uh, risk management processes is, uh, is this failure mode and effects analysis, FMEA, which is uh, used a lot in the airline industry. And then uh, the risk estimation is the process used to assign values uh, to the probability of occurrence and the severity of that harm. That's also defined in ISO 14971. So risk management, according to ISO 14971, is the systematic application of management policies, procedures, and practices to the tasks of analyzing, evaluating, controlling, and monitoring risk. And then the application of risk mitigation measures uh, looks at the frequency and character of quality control testing, the training, and accreditation to recognize standards. So this is very closely linked to what you heard about in uh, with regard to accreditation. So labs have been doing this uh, um, probably you know for a long time, but it's only in re relatively recent times that it's become more of a formal process where you you have to analyze things and analyze the risk and the risk. Uh, we have what is called a risk footprint. So if you can start off with the labs, I mentioned the patients and the lab staff. Uh, there's a risk to the institution, there's a risk to environment, community, clinical staff, as well as the laboratory staff. So basically, uh, a risk management uh, looks at what could go wrong. So you always have to ask the question, what can go wrong? What can go wrong in, in any process? Uh, and it starts, obviously starts uh, from the, from the pre-analytical stage, even before that. Um, so in, in terms of um, your, uh, so one of the things I want to leave you with is, is a, a knowledge of the published standards of the, um, of the uh, standards on risk management and so I want you to think about uh, any standards that you know, that you are aware of, and if you have come across any. Uh, so there are published um, international standards on risk management, and these are very important uh, reference documents. So the first one I mentioned is ISO 14971, which deals with medical uh, devices. Uh, then we've got uh, this, this other one, ISO 222367, so reduction of error through risk management and continual improvement. ISO 31000, uh, principle and guidelines of risk management. Uh, then ISO 31010, and then ISO guide uh, 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 73, which deals with the vocabulary. And then one of the most important documents uh, from the CLS, the EP23 document, which basically combines uh, laboratory control and quality control at least, and, and, and risk management. So these are, if there's one thing uh, that you remember from this talk is to remember this list of documents and particularly remember CLSI EP23. Uh, it's very important if you have a, you should keep a copy of this in your, in, in, in your laboratory because it's a very important reference document. 
and then ISO 15189 requirements for quality and competence in medical laboratories. So ISO 15189 uh, is in that section, uh, it states that the laboratory shall evaluate the impact of work processes and potential failures on examination results um, as, as they affect patient safety. Uh, I'm just gonna, there's a lot of background noise. I'm just gonna uh, close the door. <clears throat> Apologies for that. Um, the, the, uh, the laboratory shall evaluate the impact of work processes and potential failures on examination results. So this is what EP, uh, the EP documents look like. So there's the um, EP1882 from CLSI, and then there's the EP23A um, uh, document as well, which uh, replaced the EP23A to replace EP23P. Now, uh, if you can get hold of these documents, um, uh, very important to keep them in your laboratory as reference documents because they, they are very, very useful because they're like basically the, I would say the Bible of uh, risk management for the laboratory. Um, and other documents, uh, uh, and then this one here, the laboratory quality control based on risk management approved guideline. Uh, uh, this one, uh, these deal with um, the so this one deals with the risk analysis process, particularly these, uh, the FMEA and, and what's referred to as a fracas, failure reporting and corrective action system. Now I'm going through these very carefully. If you're not familiar with them, I suggest you um, go to these uh, reference documents. And then this one, this document has, the, one of the main things it deals with is this whole process of uh, doing the risk assessment and, 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 and embedding it in the quality control plan and then monitoring and doing corrective action. Um, so you can divide the lab, if you're looking at risk management, divide the lab obviously in the, into the traditional uh, domains of pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical, and you can divide that, subdivide those into various areas. Uh, so basically you do your uh, process analysis, evaluate where the risk points are, how they're gonna be controlled and how they're going to be monitored. And now other things that you can do when you're actually doing the risk management, you can use a number of tools. Um, again, I'm going to go through these very quickly. So normally we would have, we would do this over uh, uh, you know, a few hours, but just so that you, you're familiar with these, the process map. So the process map will just follow all the steps. Um, so it's basically step-by-step uh, -step analyzing a, a, a process and breaking it up. Uh, you can do a fishbone or Ishikawa diagram. So the fishbone diagram basically also looks at all the steps. And for example, here with the laboratory samples, operator, lab environment, uh, measuring system, reagents, and the results. And it tries to identify hazards. And then the risk assessment worksheet uh, is basically an attempt to quantify um, the, the risk and, and actually put a number so once you put a number, you can assess whether this risk is really worth uh, worrying about. So, so for example, uh, the earthquake, the, the chances of earthquakes in the Southern African region or the chances of volcanic eruptions uh, are very low. So those, you know, that would give you a very low um, uh, uh, risk estimate. So, I mentioned this from the EP23 document, the outline which looks at the, the process, and this is just a broad overview of that. Um, and then the risk, the, the risk management uh, uh, process is, is a cycle. So it's, it's a cyclical process. You have, to, you have to estimate the risk, evaluate it, put some control measures, monitor, and then uh, if there's something that's happened, you have to then decide whether how severe it was and then reintroduce the, the control measures. Now, in terms of the quality, so this is this is a quality control meeting. 
So you've got a, uh, uh, you can use the risk assessment process to develop the quality control plan. And this gives you uh, a map of how, how that is done. So you basically create the process map, estimate the risks, and then embed it. So basically the, the plan is to embed it into the quality control plan. And then you have to review the quality control plan. So for the process analysis, basically you're gathering the information uh, from a number of sources, looking at medical requirements for a test, the accreditation requirements, the actual testing process, and then uh, the testing site settings, and then you have to you break down all those steps and analyze each one to find a potential failure that could represent a significant risk to patients. And then you can analyze it further to see if the controls can be put into place to avoid the failures. Um, so you've got uh, this process map here. So this gives you uh, so, so, so an example of a starting point, and then until you get uh, uh, to the end, or till you get uh, to an error, if you get an error, you evaluate the results and then report the results, and that's the end of the process there. So you need to break it up into, and that's a, that's a high level. So this is a high level process map. Um, so basically it's very straightforward. You just think about what can, all the things that can go wrong that may not be related actually uh, uh, to the actual testing. So once you've got the uh, 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 process map, uh, you, you look for places where the errors can happen, as I said, and usually, if you want to think about it in a more simple term, there's five, there are five major areas where you can have problems. Um, this is a more detailed look of the fishbone diagram, again, showing, uh, for example, all the steps uh, that in the process and each potential issue that can happen right from the samples, whether it's an operator, the environment, the reagents and the measuring systems, so obviously the analyzer, instrument failure and instrument maintenance is an important aspect. So uh, I mentioned these here, the failure reporting analysis and corrective action system, and then fault the other, these are all different ways of actually at more, achieving more or less a similar goal. So looking at, uh, looking at a problem that's happened and then trying to put a corrective action to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, this corrective and prevent action, then there's another one called fault tree analysis. So a lot of these have come from engineering. Uh, and so a lot of the laboratory risk management uh, principles have come from engineering and particularly the aircraft, uh, aircraft in the airline industry. So this one, failure reporting analysis and corrective action, uh, it's just basically a process to identify, analyze failures. And as I said, it's come all, a lot of these things have come from industrial environments. So industrial environments where the people are using machinery, heavy machinery, where there's a lot of danger, a lot of hazards, they have to do this all the time to, because the, the risk of harm is obviously greater in an industrial environment than say in a laboratory. So we've adopted the principles of these uh, to the laboratory. And then it's basically a closed loop system. So you have, you analyze it uh, and then put in a corrective action uh, for this. And then Kappa is corrective and preventive action. Also kind of the, trying to achieve very similar things. Obviously it has a, has a formal name, uh, managed failures or non-conformance. And then the fault tree analysis Again, you, this is a more diagrammatic approach. You break it down into uh, different steps. Um, so uh, for example, here, this one here, infection during internal transport to warehouse, something went wrong and someone got injured. So you try and work out wh where the problem could have happened uh, in a step-by-step -step way. So it's more or less a, a top-down approach. 
uh, and follows a logical uh, tree of events and you get to the to the root cause uh, once you've done you've done the process map you've done the fish diagram uh, uh, the fishbone diagram and then you add you incorporate that in your quality control plan and then um, uh, and you, you you basically implement uh, those uh, mitigation procedures and yeah so that's uh, i've come to the end so that's basically um, a, a very simplified approach to to risk management so if you want to know more uh, I've, I've obviously cut it down to fit into the time slot but i think if you're not familiar with this you should have um, a very good idea of where uh, what uh, reference sources to go for if you want to start the process so just to summarize we, we the how the when is are very obvious and it's it's basically the how and why and the why is because it's part of your quality it's got to be part of your quality control plan uh, to prevent errors and and the how is basically the the steps that i've outlined you you, you can use different approaches the process map the fishbone diagram i think a lot of people use the fishbone diagram because it's it's a very um, a visual representation and it follows a very logical uh step-by-step -step approach and it branches out from each uh from each step in in the process so thank you for your attention and i look forward to your questions thank you thank you very much uh profila a pillar for that insightful discussion uh, uh, presentation on the risk management for the clinical laboratory as we work in the medical laboratory and try, uh, uh, strive to improve quality risk management is one of the issues which we have to deal with and uh, we really need to uh, minimize it as much as possible and thank you for alluding to the hows and the and when and why we need it uh, this time we are opening it up for discussion uh, questions i see no questions yet posted in the in the chat uh, in the chat room we if there is any question or contribution kindly post into the chat uh, into the chat room so that we can discuss it as uh, in the in in the round table discussion to just kick, uh, kick us uh, uh, in uh, wh 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 what do we think is the limitations for accreditation in the in the medical labs in africa uh, i'm throwing it to the the panelists and how can we as a, a, a medical laboratory practitioners uh, uh, come in and try to strengthen and uh, and improve and ensure that we have more accredited labs in our african region which assures of us of the quality of the of the laboratory results and the what uh, the standards are being added to what uh, uh, i'm throwing to the panel to for us to kick start a discussion whilst waiting for more questions to come in i could i could give a comment yes prof so, so the uh, one of the requirements for accreditation is to be part of the uh, of external quality assurance schemes equals so the problem the challenge for many um, laboratories would be the cost of being enrolled in such a scheme so people the labs that subscribe to either you know biorad or uh, cap or the australian uh, um, uh, australian scheme all of that is quite expensive in terms of uh, being a member being a subscriber and so i think there's a scope for creating a, a quality assurance scheme in africa because basically the, the the way to do it is is 
is to be able to have an institution that can prepare samples and ship it out to the various laboratories and then get the data and, and analyze the results and send the results back to the participants. So if you can set up a system like that in Africa, that is much cheaper than the ones uh, that are run from uh, outside Africa where everybody has, has to subscribe to and pay quite a high subscription fee. Uh, then you would have your average laboratory would be able to participate more often in the EQUAS scheme. And that will help their uh, move, move towards accreditation and attaining the standards that, you know, so, so basically because the, 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 the I think uh, a lot of laboratories find it very expensive basically, and we can somehow find a way to reduce expense by, by locally producing the samples and having a local quality assurance a scheme that is cheap and rather a, a low cost. Uh, and, you know, that uh, would be very affordable. I think that's probably one way that we can uh, uh, help laboratories move towards accreditation, because that's really one of the things they need to satisfy. I don't know if anybody else has any comments on that. Thank you, Prof. Pile. And uh, uh, Prof. Mandy Soza, who is, who is also coming in with an input, I think it's one of the, I just want to comment that it's one of the areas where is academ the academia and in collaboration with our colleagues in practice, we can come together and try to find ways of uh, instituting uh, or uh, putting together a, a combined effort and uh, also acknowledging the efforts being done by other colleagues, the WHO is also doing some efforts uh, the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine is also doing some efforts. But I also believe, I also uh, believe it's also good for us as African, uh, African colleagues to come to work also our African-born solution as others are helping us in this endeavor. Prof. Mandisoza, you wanted to comment? Um, just a little bit. I think it, I, I do agree with what uh, uh, Prof. Pile is saying. We need to expand the need for APRAS because uh, once we compete and compare results across countries, then you are likely to be forced to do better. Okay. The second thing is, uh, I think our training capacities in that area of quality assurance and accreditation must be strengthened. And uh, I think we really have to think of putting those, those, those uh, uh, topics in our curriculum uh, wherever necessary and strengthen the, the, the capacity to train on issues of, of uh, quality management systems. Um. Ian, can I just come in? It's uh, Prof. Erasmus from uh, Cape Town. Yes, Prof. Do uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Answer the uh, definition. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yes, please, Prof. Erasmus. Yes. So um, last week on Friday, the Africa Federation of Clinical Chemistry actually uh, involved some of our young scientists from Africa in organizing a, a webinar on various aspects of uh, quality management in the lab. And one very interesting presentation was made by our colleague from Zambia. And uh, his, his name is uh, Mr. Motale Mubanga. And he's the quality, he's the uh, quality affairs um, officer for a sub district in Lusaka. I can't remember which one. And he presented a very unique model, which I think can be adopted all over Africa. And it was based on the Slipta model, 
that was promoted by the ASLM a few years ago, but I think uh, that program uh, is now completed and many labs are now uh, using that model to, to improve the, you know, the, the quality of lab testing so that they can get accredited. Um, and, and what they used there was uh, the use of uh, Wi-Fi and internet to monitor and, uh, and, and, and be in constant touch with the various labs uh, across Zambia. So, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi is now being used as, as a tool, in fact, to improve the quality of lab services and encourage these labs to get accredited according to, you know, using the IS15189 pillars, you know, the 12 pillars of, of management. So I think it might be worthwhile um, for me perhaps to put you guys in touch with him and we can actually form an African network, you know, um, because I strongly believe it is up to us in Africa to improve the quality of lab services through uh, programs like the one we are just having, you know, bring up discussion groups, create net networks, uh, and, and, you know, really encourage ourselves to improve the quality of, of uh, lab testing and the processes involved in getting the lab accredited. So if any one of you guys are interested, I can put you guys in touch with uh, Mr. Mubanga. Uh, he, in fact, uh, trained with us uh, some five, six years ago at Tigerberg Hospital in, in Cape Town. And uh, he went back and started this big quality improvement program uh, in, in Zambia. Over to you. Th thank you very much, Prof. And uh, as you rightfully say, one of the uh, uh, products of discussions like this is finding ways of how we can get our minds together, bring solutions which can uh, affect uh, the lab in a positive way, improve the quality and the cost of uh, accreditation and the qual external quality assessment is one of the big costs that has to be borne and hence we need to find creative ways of uh, bearing uh, that cost or, or reducing that cost in a way that allows the accreditation to okay but also allowing it to be profitable. Uh, there is a, a, a witness Dobo who had raised the, 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 his hand. Um, can you kindly unmute? There's also Top, uh, Top Fumane. Top Fumane has asked a question here. Yeah. Top Fumane or, is asking, or, what about ISO 17043? Yes. So if I can just comment on that. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah. You can comment, Prof. So Tapfumane is asking, uh, I hope you're pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, he's asking about ISO 1. So ISO 17043 specifies um, what a proficiency uh, scheme provider should, uh, what, uh, basically what standards they should reach and what their requirements should be. So basically, yes, so you would need to um, um, uh, have a system. So if you, if you are a laboratory and you want to produce um, samples. So say you want to produce serum samples for a proficiency testing scheme, you will have to also achieve certain standards uh, as, as defined in ISO 17043 and, you know, your sample preparation, your sample shipping, your system of shipping, your system of receiving the results and getting the results back. All of that has to be, uh, you know, well organized. So you also have to have some kind of, you have to attain some kind of standard uh, you know, not anybody, you can't just uh, start up a scheme and start sending samples to people. You need a, a well-organized system, just like how BioRad or, or, uh, or, or uh, Australian College or et cetera does it. So, or, or, uh, so, so in a very similar way, yeah. Thanks. 
thanks, Prof. Pile, for addressing uh, Tafmane Mashe's question on to offer EQA, what are the requirements? What about ISO 17043 standard requirements? Any of the panelists who would want to comment on that one before we go to Mr. Zobo and RJ Philip? Yeah, so um, Ian, I just wanted to inform our participants that the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry last week announced an EQA program for developing countries uh, across the world. And from Africa, they, are, they have chosen two countries to run a pilot project. So the two countries are Malawi and Zambia. Um, so um, if any of the other countries from Africa might be interested, they need to apply to the IFCC and as Prof. Pille said, certain criteria will have to be satisfied before uh, that program, uh, that pilot program can be initiated in their respective uh, uh, countries. Um, so that's just, just, just some information that I just wanted to share with you guys. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to uh, witness Dobo and RJ, uh, then we we'll go to the question that has just been posted on the chat room. Uh, uh, Dobo, kindly unmute your mic. Yes, you can go ahead. All right. All right. We'll come back to the ball. Let's try RJ Philip. Kindly unmute your mic. Hello. Can you hear me now? It's witness. Yes, the ball can hear you. All right. We will hear you. Then we'll go to RJ Philip. Yes. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Machingura. Uh, thank you very much for all the presentations. Uh, I'm listening uh, from the United Kingdom. I'm a biomedical scientist who is on the ground. Thank you very much to hear from all the presenters, uh, including uh, my former lecturer, uh, Professor Mandy Sodza. Uh, this is quite enlightening and this is quite good. Uh, what I wanted to just say is me being a practicing profession professional in the lab we use ISO 15189. And from all the presentations that have been given out, you can actually see that um, what our uh, just finished presenter, what he was talking about, quality uh, risk management, there is a standard that is, in, that is actually in the ISO 15189 that actually addresses that. And also, what the Professor uh, Manisoza was talking about uh, in terms of having an accredited lab, I suggest um, that they it should be something that has to be enforced in each and every African countries, that each and every lab should be accredited. And each, each, each country should have a a national body is what Professor Mansoda said. It is vital that a national body is in each and every single country. So that national body is the one then that goes around the whole country accrediting every single clinical laboratory. When you talk about the regional, like the, I, he was talking about SENAS, when you talk about SENAS, because he was also talking about uh, competitiveness, when, uh, things like um, SENAS then will come in if, 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 if uh, you have got clients in Namibia who would say, oh, we have, got, we have head of a lab in, in Zimbabwe that does this. What did they look at first? They say, is this lab accredited? And do they meet the regional accreditation, accreditation body? 
um, then someone can send um, their samples to, to a lab. At one point, I was actually surprised from the hospital I work, I work at. We used to receive samples from United, the United States of America. And I was wondering, what is the, why, why are we receiving samples? Do we not have lab? But what did they actually see? They see, they look at our, at our accreditation and what we do. And they check first, is the lab accredited? And what is the, what, 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 what is the performance of the lab? So what I am suggesting and uh, according, um, adding to what has been already said is, I think in each and every country, we need the national accreditation body. In the United Kingdom, we have got the UCAS. You are not allowed to practice any clinical lab without the UCAS accreditation. And the UCAS then uses the ISO 15189. And if you do, if, and if anyone is actually looking for a uh, um, work, if anyone is, is looking to, to send their samples to a lab, what they look at first, they say, are you accredited by the national body? So I don't know how best this can be done in each and every country to have a national accreditation body. Then when each uh, 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 lab in a single country is accredited, then they can, it now becomes an optional to have a regional or an international accreditation. That's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Witness Dobo, for that contribution. It's a challenge to us as African countries to find ways of having national accreditation bodies as well to help us in this endeavor. And as we continue brainstorming, I think things will come out, out of this. Uh, uh, I'll go to Aj sorry, Ajay. Sorry, yes. sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Also, another thing. Sorry, sorry to bring you back. The issue of EQAs um, is very, very vital. That uh, the labs are actually performing the EQAs. It helps you to see how best you are contribute. You, you are actually contributing against other labs. But what I wanted to say, we it's it's good to join international, but it is also important for local bodies or regional to have their own EQ. EQA samples are very easy to do. I remember, like I'm saying, I'm a practicing professional. When the EQA in the country cannot find a sample, what they simply do, they just send inviting letters from laboratories. Did you ever in your practice encounter um, such kind of a scenario? Do you have a sample like say for leukemia? We are looking for a sample for leukemia. We want to send it out for EQA. So in our countries, I'm sure we are seeing a lot of uh, different scenarios that we can actually use and build up our own EQAs. It's a matter of just how can we preserve a sample that can be sent to, to laboratories around for EQAs. So I think it's something that can be done easily if there is a good and enough training around. Thank you. Yeah, so Ian, if I might just come in, um, just to buttress what witness is saying, um, there's a document that was produced by the WHO uh, and it was produced in relation to COVID-19 antigen testing. Um, in fact, I gave a talk on it to the Egyptian uh, Society for Clinical Chemistry two weeks ago. And in that document, um, some of the things that Witness has mentioned um, have been actually put out that these are ways that developing countries can institute various ways of uh, assessing their, the quality of their testing. And, uh, you know, things like repeat testing, uh, getting samples for, from sister labs, um, mm -hmm. um, having a network of labs, where you can actually exchange uh, uh, these samples. Um, and so it, it forms, um, it, you know, something that is cheap, something that is local. And very importantly, it also brings various labs together because through that uh, local EQA program, you can solve issues uh, locally. So thanks to uh, Witness for pointing that out. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And uh, it's, it's, uh, at least there are lots of resources available which we can make use of. Before we go to the 
to the to the chat i'll ask rj rj philip to unmute kindly unmute good morning good morning prof can morning, you hear me yes we can hear you rj okay okay thank you very much uh thank you prof for the presentation my name is philip aja from nigeria uh, practicing in uh, Asukuru District Hospital and Abuja's Federal Capital Treasury. I'm also a certified um, quality management system and quality assurance officer. Now, looking at quality management system as a program, is actually more of a way of life to laboratory scientists. It's more of a culture that we need to abide because you find out that the laboratory system is actually a complex one that need a quality management system to checkmate, to ensure, to validate this result you produce on daily basis. So my suggestion is, if we are going to queue into clinical chemistry, the program they are already into, I would also suggest every country need to do that, not with government strength, because you find out that when you hand over things to government, it does not work the way we wanted it to be. So, but few individuals can champion this to ensure that this will come to be. If you look at Nigeria as a case, as a case study, you find out most of the laboratory getting accreditation in Nigeria are private uh, organizations. Government organizations key into it, with time it will go down because there is no resources, there is no attention, there is no supervision. But laboratory, private laboratories are making headways. In fact, as of yesterday, a friend of mine got accreditation in Lagos. His lab was accredited because he gave attention and he followed up. All right? So I want to suggest if every one of us, being Africans, can handle our problem ourselves, I think that will go a long way to, to say much about us. It's not all the time that we need external foreign uh, foreigners to help and put the problem we have, some problem we have in Africa. The way it is now, Nigeria, for instance, have what it takes. All we need is a roadmap and a way of putting ourselves together and be able to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ajay. It's good uh, that we, we also that, uh, put it out that they, they, there is so much with amongst us, ourselves as individuals, but sometimes we, we, there is a temptation to look for help from elsewhere, whereas with what we have, there is so much we can actually do. Anyone want to comment before I read the uh, post on in the comments on the, the, the input from Ajay? from the panelists. Okay. Another comment that we have is in, from Vanessa Peace. As an assessor of medical labs in Africa, lab staff are so hungry for knowledge. Often systems are started in labs and when the mental leave system collapse, as Prof Pile states, EQA is vital and also staff training and competency. There is often so many problems with maintaining. Yeah, Vanessa does raise an issue. It's, it's a challenge, especially when the champions leave and uh, things depend, are depending on, on that individual, not a group effort towards that. And hopefully with this, uh, discussion, this presentation, we will be able to instill the desire of uh, uh, improving quality in the lab, uh, that all the lab professionals own quality, that, that we are responsible for quality. It's not only the quality manager who might be so much interested in, in it in the lab, but it's part of the testing and it gives us pride in being producers of quality results, which can be vouched for in any, any way. And uh, also uh, the issue of uh, 
a training being available, at least with forums like this, we can be able to exchange ideas, knowledge, and experiences as well, so that we help one another in different countries and strengthen one another. And, and maintenance is also a, a problem uh, uh, as well as indicated. Uh, in, in maintaining the, the, the desire to continue working towards uh, quality improvement. But we hope we as scientists will have the desire to co continue to want to improve the standards. Anyone wants to comment on that? Uh, uh, oh, maintaining equipment and getting measurement system calibrated as well is a, a challenge because for accreditation to uh, 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 we also need to be to have your equipment maintained or some of the equipment calibrated by an accredited uh, company and this also shows that there is gaps in our systems which we can find creative ways of uh, addressing and uh, putting solution or uh, I think that's also room for innovative companies coming out of universities in Africa to fill these gaps that we notice as we try to strengthen our quality system. Anyone who wants to comment on that uh, post? I think we, I talked about, anyone I talked about the ISO, um, the ISO 17025, which looks into the, the, the calibration system. As long as we don't implement those requirements in our ISO standards, we will have challenges. I think that goes back to, again, the need to, to make sure we practice uh, the, uh, the, the issues of accreditation using uh, correct uh, standards, yeah, because uh, uh, this is the reason why the systems fail, not just because we are not uh, meeting certain requirements of uh, specific standards. Thank you, Prof. Mansoza. Anyone from the panelists who would want to comment? Another post comes from uh, Kingston Omo Emma. Please share details of IFCC and EQA also interested. All right. Uh, you uh, will we'll, we'll share with you the, 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 the details uh, if you can for uh, indicate your email address, we'll be able to share with you as well. And uh, is, uh, Kingston Omo Emanu also said, also interested in linking up with the lead in Zambia, uh, who developed a Wi-Fi based quality management system. Uh, that's fine. We can. Link and uh, link you. We saw uh, we have seen your email. We will link you up and uh, find ways of uh, 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 linking you up. And that, that's the whole purpose of this, to, in order to to find ways of uh, uh, improve, um, uh, improving from our networks. Uh, uh, all right. There is a hand raised. Uh, uh, right, right, right. Is there and raised, raised? Yes. Can yes. you hear me? It's it's yes. uh, it's witness again. Uh, very very interesting and very interested in actually contributing to this live debate. Uh, what I wanted just to also add uh, on what uh, Professor Mansoza said regarding to how can we make sure, yeah, the, the if if the lab is accredited and is using 
uh, 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 some ISO standards, like I say, 15189. 15189, uh, it looks at the, it has got a standard within it that looks at that that when the when the accreditors come in, they say you say you use this machine to do your hematology samples or your FBC. They say okay, we want to see all the documentation. We want to look at the calibrate the calibration. They want to see the results. They want to see the full report. There is a there is a lot of documentation that they actually look at. These are some of the things that we actually do yearly because here it's a yearly process. It's done every single year. So you know that after, when your time is coming, there is quite a lot of preparation for you to actually uphold your own accrediting uh, certificates. So you find the, 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 the standards like ISO 15189, it has got the standard of which uh, Professor Mansoza was talking about. So accreditation will actually meet this requirement that we make sure that the machine that we are using are accredited, if, this, if uh, calibrated, if the lab is accredited. Then in terms of uh, um, competence, there was something about competence. And also if the, 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 these uh, 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 accreditation standards, they actually require, when they come in, they will just say, okay, we want to know, they, they, they take a sample and said, who processed this sample? Then they look because should, they should have an audit trail. Then they just pick because they don't come and say, we want to pick anyone, they want to pick someone. They look at a sample and they, pick it then they look who actually who were the people involved in this sample and then they actually say can we see the competence of this person so they need, they look at the portfolio of that patient so if the lab is actually accredited everyone should have a portfolio everyone should meet the competence such that if someone leaves the the the, the, the area the, the 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 laboratory that um laboratory should not be deprived of uh, of of the competent people who should continuously run it because the quality the, the quality management system requires almost everyone to be at a level of understanding what is happening. So accreditation is the key point that everyone who works in the lab should have required competence to do certain procedures in the lab. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Read the last chat, chat then uh, ask the, 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 uh, the presenters for parting notes before I, 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 we go to the closure. Uh, the, this one is Tari Sai Shevirira. What if a laboratory cannot access an accredited laboratory in the country, if, if, for instance, in Zimbabwe, for calibration for ancillary equipment? What criteria can we use in choosing a lab for the calibration of the equipment? Uh, anyone who wants to attempt that uh, uh, among the, uh, uh, the presenters, uh, what criteria can we use? I think we still have a challenge as far as uh, Zimbabwe is concerned, because uh, uh, calibration falls under the ISO 170245, rather. Uh, that one, um, we are still to, to determine, for example, in this country, which laboratory has been created, um, accredited on the basis of that standard. If there is one, maybe we can use that level for the tasks associated with the uh, calibration and uh, calibration and and and, and uh, testing uh, assessment. But I think today we still have a challenge because. This is the reason why we are saying accreditation is now almost like a must. If you want to be assured of quality results, let's get accredited. And these challenges that we are facing are due to the fact that uh, almost uh, the majority of our laboratories 
are not accredited using the correct standards. Thank you, Prof. Mandisoza. Anyone who wants to comment uh, before we have parting shots from the panelists? All right. It shows the gap where we can find ways of meeting a gap, and uh, at least we solutions can be can come through. Oh, Ajay wanted to say something. All right. Uh, I'll, Unmute, then say something before we go to the parting shots. Okay, I just want to ask a prof. Was prof, thank you very much for the presentation. But I hope we are getting a soft copy of the presentation to enable us to go through it. Or yes, we will find ways of uh, getting to you the presentations if you require them. That's fine. Okay. No problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ajay. Okay, I'll ask for parting shots uh, uh, before we uh, before I have a clo closure. And uh, also, whilst colleagues, the presenters are uh, uh, preparing to give their parting shots, I just want to bring to the attention of all participants that we uh, we have a, a virtual point of care. Africa International Conference being organized for the 11th and the 12th of May. Uh, the, uh, this coming month is being organized by the African Federation of Clinical Chemistry, the South African Association for Clinical Bi Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine, and Cape Peninsula Invest of Technology, uh, a, a unit of the South African uh, Med Medical Research Council, the Cardio Metabolic Unit. And in this workshop, the addressing issues to do with point of care in Africa. And there are 15 international speakers from USA, Canada, Norway, Holland, UK, India, Egypt, Kenya, South Africa participating. And there will be two uh, workshops, one on the 11th, one on the 12th, and also an exhibitor's day. Kindly also register. We have sent you the, the links if, uh, for, for that workshop. Kindly register. If you can, it will be interesting in, uh, in getting this uh, in, in form, uh, in, uh, to get to this workshop and you exchange ideas and learn from one another. And also to note that the, the, uh, this will be available on a recorded session on, a, on, a, on, a, on the Facebook page of Empower uh, School of Health. Uh, if you go to the Facebook page, you'll be able to get to this recording. Any parting shots from the presenters before I close? Prof. Erasmus, do you want to say um, anything? Well, I think on behalf of the Africa Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Lab Medicine, I want to thank the two speakers uh, for enlightening our colleagues uh, across Africa. And indeed, this is the purpose of these uh, webinars that we are organizing uh, in that we can reach a lot of our colleagues that otherwise would have spent, uh, um, you know, their funds coming to attend such uh, meetings, which in the past we have organized, uh, you know, on a face-to-face -face basis. So I think there's a great opportunity here to use the technology available to us to reach out uh, to to our colleagues uh, across Africa, and I and I know that there's a great need for us to start these discussions on how we can improve the quality of testing uh, uh, across uh, Africa and to get our labs accredited uh, so that uh, you know, we, we can be seen uh, to achieve those international standards. Um, Ian, I'm just wondering, did you inform everyone of the 
the uh, the AFCC conference on point of care testing. Yes, I've just informed colleagues of the workshop. Uh, yes, um, it, it's a it's a conference. Yes, it's a, it's yes, a it's on a, the a of conference. Twelfth okay. of May. Okay. The uh, the one. Uh, yes, I did. Okay, eleventh right. of May and twelfth of May. Uh, Prof. Yes. Pillay, do you have anything to say? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity. I think, as you were saying, this is, um, uh, there's definitely a need for more of more workshops of of this kind, uh, and this is something I think we should we should you should make this a, a regular occurrence. Uh, we had a lot of um, interesting comments and interesting questions from the participants. And I think, yes, we do have, um, uh, we have a, quite a way to go in terms of um, improving laboratory services in, in Africa as a whole. But I think we are moving in the right direction. And certainly I think, um, uh, our operating um, motto should be self-sufficiency. I think self-sufficiency uh, we it's become more and more apparent uh, that self-sufficiency is important. Certainly, in terms in, in with with the COVID pandemic, we need uh, self-sufficiency for reagents. We need self-sufficiency for uh, reagent production. We need self-sufficiency for vaccine production. And I think we need self-sufficiency for quality assurance as well. Uh, we can't be uh, uh, always, you know, standing with a begging bowl uh, for the to the rest of the world to help us out. I think we need to become, as far as the laboratory, and we are in the laboratory field, we need to work towards, certainly work towards uh, self-sufficiency. Thank you. Thank you, um, Prof. Erasmus and Prof. Pile. Prof. Mansoza, any parting shots before I, I say the word of closure? Uh, not much, but to say uh, accreditation is the way forward for the continent. There is no time, there is no longer any time that we should rest in sending, uh, I mean, depending on countries uh, overseas. I think as long as we accredit we use accredited laboratory facilities, it means we are going to produce quality results. Thank you for participating in the, your comments. Uh, all of us that they try to help to, to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I just once again would want to remind you of the Point of Care African International Conference being organized on the 11th and the 12th May by the African Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine and the South African Association of Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine in uh, and the Cardiometabolic Unit of uh, at Cape Peninsula University of Technology, uh, which is a unit of the South African Medical Research Council. And to note, there are some international uh, speakers, about 15 of them. Uh, we have sent the link to your emails. And also to note that these sessions we are doing are being recorded. And uh, the Facebook link has been sent to the, to, the to the chat screen. You can also have a look at it and also share with your colleagues who are not, who are not able to be part of this discussion because our effort is to improve lab capacity in Africa. Some can attend live, some can see the web, uh, the, 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 the Facebook presentation several days later, but they all achieve the same purpose. I just want to thank all the participants for spending your time in, in this uh, insightful discussion and uh, also, our, our speakers, uh, uh, Prof. Arthur Mansoza and uh, Prof. Tahaya Pile for the insightful presentation and Prof. Era uh, Rajiv Erasmus for also uh, facilitating this uh, pre presentation. I thank you all.
and also would want to thank the University of Zimbabwe, Department of Laboratory Diagnostic and Investigative Sciences, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, Department of Biomedical Sciences, Stellenbosch University Division of Chemical Pathology, and the University of Pretoria Department of Chemical Pathology, the African Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, and last but not least, Empower School of Health, who has made this webinar possible. We they, uh, as they did they worked hard for the uh, flyers to be produced for the advertising of the event the hosting of the event, Sonia and the team are working hard behind the scene to enable us to be live on this discussion. We would like to thank them. And th there is many more to come. Please keep watch the space. We'll be having more and more discussions and we do not want it to end with discussions only, but we would want to have results. And I do trust this consortium will result in products and services which are an African solution to the African problem of improving quality of laboratory practice in Africa. Thank you very much for your time. Let's have a good, good day and a good week. Thank you very much.